thanks for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and Norway is um, a very special uh, country because I worked for many years at the UN, and it was always the Norwegian support for human rights, for a lot of our work, and even for my VR work was originally seated by uh, the Norwegian government, the prime minister's office. So it's always, um, I'm always very grateful to be here. Um, I'm just going to whiz through um, a lot of um, my journey and a little bit of my thinking on virtual reality. I was very fortunate to be a early sort of adopter of this in 2014, where I started out making documentaries at the UN, uh, most notably Clouds Over Cedra, which some of you might have seen. And um, I've gone from there now to into academia, where I'm at Johns Hopkins University, where I've started a new program. It's a master's level, master's level program and also a lab on immersive storytelling and emerging technology. And um, it's incredible because the thesis for me always was that you have to use art and creativity with technology to show impact to change society. And that's not always obvious for people uh, working in industry or working in a bureaucracy like the UN or even in academia, but we're gonna continue to do that. And this is just a, a short video that gives a little flavor for what we're doing. What's really unique about all of the projects that I've seen today here at ICIT is the really vast spectrum of projects and how they're approaching technology. Some coming from very personal, intimate stories, others who are coming from interest in tech and how that can shape culture. Being at the summit is hugely inspiring for us. Coming to environments like this reminds me why I do what I do. Um, so seeing people sharing the works that they've made. Oh, okay, okay. It kind of gave you a sense of realism, like you really felt like you were, you were in it. It was, it was really weird, but like, cool. A lot of them sort of make use of some different technologies. Um, like there's an experience that has you pose as a social worker, uh, and it uses voice recognition technology to have you ask questions. It's under $20,000 for a household. We're all bumping around, and we're all learning and we're all learning how to tell uh, great stories in these new technological mediums. All the scenes are like real and it feels like I was just in the scene and I can just look around. You gotta dive in, you gotta start creating and it's a process and it's tough and it's difficult and everything's moving so fast. We're building the airplane as we're in flight but the creation tools are there and you really just need to get both of your hands into it and start thinking about it. That was a really internal, like a personal experience, and you experience it differently than you would in a, you know, in a movie theater or even, you know, sitting in bed watching Netflix. Now, in this new landscape, it's not broadcast author audience anymore. That becomes much more blurred. Because it seems like it's still a media that's at the very beginnings, and it's really inspiring to hear that these people are really deeply concerned about equity and about social justice. I'm just, you know, buzzing with ideas and just extremely excited to see what's next, you know, for VR, AR, technology, AI. Have you ever reunited with anybody you've helped? If you can bring art, technology, and the sciences together with intersectional lens, with true and authentic diversity that really encourages the community to do a democratized imagination of the future of Baltimore, I think that this city has the potential to lead in the idea of imagining the future around these emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, immersive media, bioengineering, and the Internet of Things. And I think that Johns Hopkins can be part of partnership and true community building to unpack a version of the future that we couldn't see otherwise. Thank you for being our partner in this work. Thank you. I think everyone from Hollywood to New York theater scene and beyond is excited by the potential of this medium, and the young kids are the ones making it pop. So, you know, social impact, uh, it really has a lot to do with understanding artistic movements as well. And when you give these technologies to a lot of creators, 
a lot of unexpected, beautiful things happen that are not just about entertainment. They change our worldviews, and a lot of incredible tools and a lot of different things come out of it because it's creative people, and that's what's incredible. And a lot of what we, what that video was about was what we just did in Lillehammer with the off-piste, uh, the first off-piste lab here in Norway, and it was similarly incredible of what people can come up with if they're just trying to come up with a way to express themselves, you know? So a lot of VR and a lot of what we've been able to do initially has been called VR for good because a lot of the work that has come out has been able to show impact, express different crises, do different things. But I think it's more important to think about things in terms of technology and artistic movements in the past. If you look at this very simple metal can that was able to exist in the late 1800s because of the Industrial Revolution, it allowed impressionism to happen. It allowed people to finally leave the studio and go out and use new tools to express new ways of doing it. Uh, you know, of course, this wave of VR, I'd say since 2014, 2015, um, allowed VR to leave very complicated laboratories and computer science departments and go out into the street where you didn't necessarily need a lot of this and you could share a lot of the vision of VR uh, that was happening in that way. Um, you know, microphones changed the way people sang in the 30s and led to new movements of how people expressed themselves. Like Billy, we wouldn't have Billy Holiday if you didn't have certain technologies and you'd have, you wouldn't have the same emotional states. You might not have uh, Fidel Castro either, but anyway. Um, you know, uh, a very pertinent example is something with electronic music and craft work where they invented tools like the sequencer to really kind of have a, a new ability to express themselves that changed the face of pop music and changed, I think, the way we kind of look at the world. And I think that's an important thing to look at, that when you give these technologies to storytellers, uh, a lot of very unexpected things happen and a lot of new markets get created. But more importantly, we look at ourselves and each other and our world differently. Um, and, you know, this is, let me see right here. Uh, similarly, VR creators like Depth Kit uh, is a good example where they wanted to capture people volumetrically, but they didn't have the option because most people who wanted to get captured volumetrically had to go to New York or LA, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for volumetric capture. They hacked the Kinect sensor. They basically just democratized it and now are revolutionizing storytellers that people can do it in their living room by just getting a Kinect sensor. And I think that's an example of what we need to continue to see and will continue to happen. And of course, now I'm using this tool to capture survivors of certain diseases like cancer and other things at Johns Hopkins because we want to build those stories into tools that will work in clinical environments. But it comes from artists, and I think that's really important that we privilege that and understand the power of storytelling. So, you know, we, it's not the first time we've been trying to use mediums to kind of express our, our inner state to other people. You know, we've started with the cave, we've had paintings, but it's really photography, and it's sort of coming into the scene in the late 1800s that a lot of people thought we finally will be able to get to a truth. And that's what a lot of people started doing with photography. They, lot, they used it and they said, this is the first time we can share a lot of these facts of what's happening. Because if we share these sort of facts, we'll be able to end these sort of atrocities. And I think similarly with VR, there is this notion that finally I can express my, my real feeling or we can become a refugee or you could become someone who's suffering. But it really isn't the simulation of it. You still have to use a lot of abstraction. You still need that storytelling. It's not as simple as if you lived my life and saw what I did without the context of what it was, I don't think you would really um, get the same sort of feeling of it. And you know, even if we so rely on these things for truth, we realize that there is a lot of manipulation of this truth, and I think that's something we have to take into account. Photography, this is actually the first sort of example of fake news, because this is Abraham Lincoln's portrait that was 
photoshopped even back then with negatives to really give him a, a better body than he had. You could look that up. Um, it's crazy. But it just shows you that there is power will come with these technologies and power will try to use and manipulate it because they did it with photography. Why wouldn't they with something like VR? Um, you know, at the, at the end of the First World War, people made all these gruesome pictures of the worst things you could possibly imagine um, happening and tried to pass them around as a way to prevent further wars from happening. But it doesn't always work. Vietnam, uh, I'll just go through a little bit here. Oh, thank you. Um, Vietnam, uh, you know, you could say is the first sort of televised war that used that technology to try to express violence and pain. Uh, Syria, I think you could say, is, you know, some of the first ones that use YouTube as user, again, a new technology that's trying to change our relationship to violence in our inner states. And I think it's about understanding where we're, where we're coming from and where VR can learn from some of these other technologies and what are some of the pitfalls. Because I think if you're too sensational with this and you're not using storytelling, um, you just grow numb to these things. And we have a lot of evidence from public health studies that show that if you're shocking, if you're just trying to kind of scare people, it can actually have the opposite behavioral effect. You need to be a little bit more of a, a metaphor. And this is actually one of the, I grew up with this, um, this ad where it was your brain on drugs frying. And surprisingly, this was one of the most effective sort of storytelling things. It was more effective than showing somebody dying of a drug overdose, right? And I think it's important to think of that. And I think it's important to think of what the VR version is of that. This is one of my favorite ones, actually. It's very funny. Maybe it should be an iPhone now. Because it is passivity that dulls feeling. It is this sort of idea that when you just use it without storytelling and just try to shock people with certain images for social impact, um, you become numb. You know, you, 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 you freeze up, you know, in, in a lot of ways. And I think Susan Sontag, I recommend everyone to read her because she's such a great theorist on thinking about photography, but a lot of what she says is very relevant for VR as well. Um, again, you know, we also, if you just show horrible things and don't use storytelling, we do have a lustful relationship to violence, and so much of that is seen in our films and our myths and everything. But they're more sometimes about entertainment than they are about action. Um, also, you know, if I show you someone being killed and they're an African American, um, it depends what your relationship is to how you view certain people. And certain people's suffering can be in other people's revenge. Um, so, you know, the same picture of Ilan that was used to mobilize people in Europe. Um, was used by ISIS to say that this is what happens if you do leave. So there's a manipulation of things if there isn't like a you know, good storytelling used with some of these things. So you know, just as an example, I think you know, these sensational shocking pictures or even using VR to do that kill storytelling. And you know, it really is about having that imagination and figuring out where that imagination is allowed to roam free within a virtual space that I think can be very powerful. Uh, I'm just going to flow through this a little bit because there's a lot of stuff here. And I wanted to think, you know, just to kind of, I'll just go through here. Sorry. Life? Um, a little bit about the UN because I think that's something that is very interesting for people. That was probably the first place where I was able to show real impact with our work and really the sort of idea of VR being an empathy machine, VR making social impact, a lot of it comes from a documentary called Clouds Over Cedra. And this is just like a small sort of case study of what we did there. According to the United Nations, the number of countries struggling with humanitarian crises is at an all time high. The international community hasn't experienced this many refugees, asylum seekers, and displaced persons since World War II. But how do we galvanize policymakers who are sometimes so far removed from the world's crises? The United Nations needed a new tool to amplify empathy, which is why UN advisor Gabo Aurora and Verse creator Chris Milk teamed up to create a VR experience from the perspective of 12-year-old Syrian refugee named Citra. Of the millions who have fled the Syrian civil war, over 84,000 have taken up temporary residence in the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan, without any clear indication of when they can go home. 
In order to communicate this ongoing frustration, Verse captured Sidra's story with the aid of Verse's proprietary 360-degree camera technology. The footage was then stitched together using Verse tool software and made ready in time for the World Economic Summit in Davos. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and Emma Watson were among the dignitaries backing the launch of Clouds Over Sidra. The film was experienced by over 120 global leaders who all experienced Sidra's refugee camp through her eyes. Donations to the Syrian refugee effort have skyrocketed since the rollout of Clouds. The piece also screened at Sundance, South by Southwest, the TED Talks, and the Third International Humanitarian Appeal for Syria, which was held in Kuwait. Countless humanitarian advocates, policymakers, and the general public have experienced Sidra's story. Clouds Over Sidra is the first in a series of collaborations between Verse and the UN. With demand for touching VR experiences on the rise, the UN has found its empathy machine. Well, I'm going, I'm going to stop there and I, I'll just say, I'll just say that, what's it? <laughs> I'm crying inside this. This is probably one of the most vivid experiences of my life. So, this is some scenes from, from there. Um, so, it's, it's interesting because when I started doing it, people were like, oh, VR, VR, it's incredible. Look what it's doing. It's making people cry. We've also brought it out into the streets with UNICEF where we show it to people and it's starting to double donations in 40 different countries and 15 different languages. But I'm always like, yes, it's VR, it's a technology, but it's also the storytelling and art that goes with it. We work very hard to craft these things. I work very hard with some of the most leading sort of storytellers in the world to kind of understand how you can make this effective within it. And now, no matter if you're doing VR training, nurses training, enterprise, you can learn from these things because we learn about eye level and distances and framing and slow motion and what works to create an emotional response because no matter what you're doing, you want to create an emotional response. You want behavior change. You want people to engage with something. And so there's a lot you can do to engage these immersive storytellers within your work, even though they are in separate worlds. My hope is that in the future, the same way we hire an accountant to do our books, we hire storytellers to help us think about all of our tools and all of our ways of how we kind of make things more effective. So. Um, We've been able to uh, show some measurable impact from some of this, and this is some of the data. And as I'd said, we made the film into a two-minute version, and with UNICEF, uh, showed it in 40 different countries, and it just consistently, to this day, we did a pilot program that we started in Oslo, we were in New Zealand, and now, even now as we speak, someone is watching Clouds of Procedure somewhere, probably, and being told to donate, and is donating at double the rate. So I think that's a really incredible thing because you know we're able to with this sort of technology affect and get so much more information from people this is really just the beginning i started in 360 i moved to room scale i moved to interactive then we started doing shared experiences with avatars and recently i just did something on the magic leap headset which is also a very incredible ar tool and we're starting to see that all of these will merge together as one but in the beginning, all I could get was I could tell where people were looking, but now soon we'll be able to tell how people are feeling um, and get a lot more data and a lot more evidence. Is this a smoke machine? This is great. No, I'm joking. It's like a disco in here. Um, so, um, you know, it is about charity and it is about money, but, you know, it is about changing people's minds and hearts. Um, you know, kind of what I think the United States wanted to do before the Iraq invasion, change people's hearts and minds. Well, maybe they should have used VR. I'm joking. Um, but it is something that we are seeing. We, we showed this, with this documentary of Gaza uh, in, um, in, um, in the streets of Tel Aviv, and we were able to kind of measure people's baseline sort of attitudes towards Palestinians and try to have workshops. So there's a lot you could do. Uh, I want to show you this, because this is a case study from something that's particularly relevant to Europe.
The Last Goodbye is a powerful personal testimony of the Holocaust, preserved for the first time in poignant room-scale virtual reality. Survivor Pinchas Guter takes audiences with him on one last visit to the Nazi concentration camp Majdanek, as he says a final goodbye to his family, who were murdered there during World War II. In 2016, the production team traveled with Guter to Poland to capture hours of 3D video and tens of thousands of photos, which were then brought to life with dozens of photogrammetry artists and engineers. The entire experience uses the most innovative new technology to enable viewers to walk with Guter eye to eye as he revisits the railway car, gas chamber, shower room, and barracks of Majdanek. USC Shoah Foundation has created the first ever Holocaust survivor testimony in room scale VR, which will be entered into their official archive for generations to come. USC Shoah Foundation is dedicated to making audiovisual interviews with survivors of the Holocaust and other genocides as a compelling voice for education and action. The experience premiered at Tribeca Film Festival and has toured internationally at a host of public screenings, including Venice Film Festival, Future of Storytelling, and is now available to global audiences. Dorf wie mein stippt sich in der Brei, in die Wagonen. So, um, that was an experience that I was able to do with Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation. And again, was able to use the power of technology and storytelling to kind of create and modernize how a lot of young people will think about the Holocaust into the future. And it really is these sort of new technologies that are showing new engagements of how these things will, will work. And, you know, I don't like to have formulas, but I do think there is something about using emerging technologies and having a question, you know? And, you know, can, for instance, social VR improve the way we experience digital memorials or other things that we're trying to deal with? And so, I think it's important to have these sort of social context, the problem and everything. And this is something, you know, we've gone on after I did that experience in the Holocaust, we did something with ICANN, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize um, two years ago. We were commissioned to kind of do something with the Nobel Prize Committee and, and create an experience in social VR relating to those testimonies. Um, and, you know, just to show that I do have a sense of humor, um, we, we, I did a musical sort of piece where we try to make people dance and kind of come understand Sufism to understand that Islam is much more than extremism, that there is a mystical, beautiful, interesting side. So this is just a short video of people. <laughs> So the potential is really endless, and a lot of the things that I was able to show you really continue. Uh, what's exciting about this technology, um, I sometimes try to think, is this moment with VR in artistic expression, will it be looked at as like the silent film era? Or sometimes I wonder if it, is it like a fine wine, you know? and I know this is Dionysius, um, because it is very rare to be able to, it is hard because you know you think a lot of people can't see it and there isn't distribution, but we're seeing greater impact, but you have to be more creative on how that impact is made, right? So we have to connect different dots. And I was able to say, oh, there's people already asking for money, what if we put VR in that? Oh, nurses are doing simulations that are spending all this money on theater actors, how do we build VR into that? And how do we make it more effective? And that's the most important thing. It's not only cost cutting, 
or money, it's actually a greater, deeper engagement. And when I say VR could be like a fine wine, you know, some of my work from five years ago, because now the Oculus Quest headset is completely selling out and doing so well, and more and more people are adopting the technology, um, the same work I did five years ago continues to be seen by more and more people. And I think it's very edifying that whatever you do here today or whatever you continue to invest in and put your money behind, there is a very, very good chance that it will continue to flourish in the years ahead and the time to get in is now. Thank you.